It is our joy and pleasure to present programs like this to the public, which we do without charge so as many people as possible can join us. Uh, but it's my undying and unshakable belief that an appreciation of local history is the key to all forms of community engagement and the, the many things that we all do that keep our town such a great place to live. It is your generosity that is bringing us this program tonight and all the other events on our schedule. We are entirely supported by our members and sponsors. We do not receive funds from the town to the state and unfortunately we do not have a rich uncle in the background tucked away to rescue us. So please take a look at our membership page and um, if you're a museum goer, there's a very good deal on reciprocal memberships that you should also check out. Thank you for your patience and here we go. Timothy Otis Fuller was a naturalist and his field of study was Needham. For him, the treasures of our township were inexhaustible and he studied them for 50 years. Fuller's roots in Needham reached very deep. He was born into a family that had settled in this area in the 1600s. Members of the Fuller family signed the petition that established Needham as a separate town from Dedham in 1711. In 1871, Fuller married Abby Ella Mills, a daughter of another, Needham, another of Needham's founding families. Fuller served for a while as the town auditor, and in 1902 was appointed to the Committee for a Town History. The committee commissioned George Kuhn Clark's History of Needham, and then in 1911 planned the town's bicentennial celebrations. The committee was the precursor to the Needham Historical Society, and in 1915, Fuller and his wife Abby were among the incorporators of the society. Timothy Otis, as he was generally known, was born in 1845, the second of the five children of Ezra Fuller Jr. and Catherine Smith Fuller. Ezra Fuller kept a general store on the corner of Great Plain and Central Avenues, the site of the old tavern. Fuller's mother Catherine and her brother Timothy Newell Smith were both talented artists and they taught Fuller as a youngster to draw and paint. Fuller's formal schooling was not extensive. He was apparently homeschooled by his mother and did not attend college like his older brother. He was nevertheless well-educated and was considered to be a prodigy in mathematics. As an adult, he worked as a store clerk and as a glue manufacturer before settling into a long lasting career as the treasurer of the Revere Sugar Company in Boston. And these are some sketchbooks from when he was about eight or nine years old. And you can see he's already um, drawing, drawing his birds and some other sketches and that note on the front of his sketchbook by his mother, make your marks with precision and neatness, your mother. But, but she, was quite, she was quite a good artist as was her brother and they, they taught him quite well. As a youngster, Fuller formed a, a friendship with his neighbor, the physician Josiah, Josiah Noyes and became his protege in the study of natural history. Noyes was the doctor in town, the first physician in Needham to have a medical degree. He was born in Acton and went to college at Dartmouth. In 1825, having received his degrees in medicine and chemistry, he came to Needham because his uncle, Thomas Noyes, the pastor in the West Parish, told them that there was a doctor needed here. Noyes was a scientist in the way that you could still be in the mid-1800s. He was interested in medicine and pharmacology, but also ornithology, geology, geography, botany, and linguistics. He was a stalwart in the temperance and abolitionist movements in Needham, created the Needham Lyceum, and was the main force between the split in 1854 between the first parish and the evangelical congregational parish. The earliest systematic botanical collections in Needham were made by Dr. Noyes, beginning in, in the 1830s and carrying on until the 1870s when he died. In the approved 19th century manner, Noyes pressed his samples between the pages of books. Each specimen was labeled. He also recorded the precise location of his finds so that later botanists could look for them as well. Fuller was a generation younger than Noyes, but he grew up across the street from Noyes' home on what is now Noyes Street Fuller became Noyes' protege in the matter of Needham's natural history, and Noyes shared his knowledge, notebooks, and collections with Fuller. Fuller especially valued Noyes' collections and documentation because they allowed him to observe changes in the local flora over time. He was especially keen on the topic of rare plants, 
not for their rarity per se, but because he wanted to know why certain plants persisted, even in tiny numbers, while most either increased or died out altogether. He identified several very rare plants that occurred in limited or even single stands and tracked several of them over, over the years. Fuller was a patient and meticulous observer to, agree, to a degree that I think would make most of us scream, but it also meant that he was tireless in investigating corners and wastelands and places less accessible than most. As a naturalist, Fuller modeled himself on Henry David Thoreau, whom he called the mastermind. His knowledge was based on patient and minute observation. Also like Thoreau, Fuller was a prodigious walker, walking in pursuit of his studies to wound socket on one occasion and as far as Ipswich on another. He was especially fond of the White Mountains and was an experienced climber, as was his wife, who often accompanied, accompanied him. Most of Fuller's rambles, however, took place within the confines of Needham, where he examined every brook, every woodland, and even the waste places beyond, beside the roads. And this is one of Fuller's um, samples. Can you, oh, can you see my cursor? Fuller samples here that he that he dried on a card. This is a picture of it in in, when it, in life and it's fresh, and you can see from the card found found by my sister in her house yard. So there was no no place too exalted or humble to need him for for Fuller to collect his plants. Fuller made his own plant collections and was able to nearly double the number of plant species identified in Needham. Noyes had identified over 400 and Fuller increased that to 711. Noyes notes and collections were continu continued and expanded by Fuller to the extent that the two became intertwined. Fuller's herbaria were given to the New England Botanical Club of which he was a founding member and they are now a part of the Harvard University herbaria. Together, Noyes and Fuller collected and preserved about 2,500 samples which is still the largest systematic collection from any locality in Massachusetts. And this uh, is a page from one of his notebooks where he kept his, his finding notes, his ongoing observations, and unfortunately some of them in shorthand, which I still have to decipher. There he is with his um, wife, Abby, at, in Tennessee at uh, what's called Hanging Rock, I think. Look out, look out, look out, Rock. It's scary to me. <laughs> Although a writer of considerable skill, Fuller did not publish his works. With two exceptions, his extant writings take the form of pamphlets and manuscripts. His observations were primarily kept in his herbaria and in his field journals, painstakingly compiled and revised over the years. Timothy Otis was also a man of, very, of many interests, though not quite so many as Dr. Noyes. Botanist was the label he most coveted, but he is most familiar to us as an ornithologist, the author and illustrator of the magnificent set of bird observation journals that he kept between 1904 and 1912. We have a better way of, of studying birds these days than by shooting them. There is little need for killing a bird and identifying it. We now have museums filled with ample specimens of every species and books are cheaply bought giving accurate descriptions of every bird we can hope to see. So we arm ourselves with that indispensable weapon of the modern, star modern bird gazer and opera glass. Although his herbaria and botany notebooks made up the bulk of Fuller's work, his bird journals are by far the most detailed and beautiful. Because of his aversion to killing the birds in order to study them, Fuller chose to use his considerable artistic skill to record the characteristics of the species he saw. There are four journal volumes dated 1904, 1906, 1908, and 1912, though some of the observations are dated as early as 1901. Together with his unpublished writing, writings on birds, all dating after 1900, it seems that ornithology as a systematic study was a later interest in Fuller's life, taken up during his fifth decade. The books show a clear progression of sophistication over time. The first volume, 1904, which is, this is a page from it, is spare and modest. The relatively few illustrations are ink and pencil in black and white, tipped in after the entries were written. 
1906, the Tipton illustrations are in color, painted by Fuller as he had been taught by his mother and his uncle many years before. By 1908, the illustrations, both in color and black and white, are integrated into the text with ongoing extra notes, pictures, and bird songs stuck into the pages over time. Here's a, a page comparing shrikes, the Northern shrike and the migrant shrikes. Um, note uh, quotes, he quotes not all, he quotes Burroughs. These are fellow um, naturalists. He quotes uh, journals, the Auk, uh, which is a, it was a uh, ornithology journal at the time. So he's incorporating not only his own observations, but research that he's doing and the research that his colleagues are doing, the people that he's talking to. And then he's adding in um, little, little observational bits over, over time. You see just above the loggerhead shrike, uh, there's a nest in thorny hedges, low trees about seven feet, eggs three to five. So he's making these notes as he goes along to add to the information in his journals. Um, I should also note that these books precede Peterson's field guides by about 30 years. The journals are a dynamic record of Fuller's observations and his researchers. Entries of the journals record the dates when the bird was active in Needham and the bird's physical characteristics, its size, coloring, songs, identifying features, and so forth. Tucked into the margins, as I said, between the lines are references from journals, such as the AUK, notes from scientific publications, and from the work of colleagues. Um, he's got a comparison here of song notes that uh, Dr. Hoy says, Dr. Hoy says it does quick, 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 but Payne says it's not a whistle, it's more like bequi, key, 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 whatever. <laughs> and he has his own, he has his own opinion on this as well. So he's so he's recording, he's recording the, the different opinions, he's recording the current research, but um, he's also recording the very specific Needham data, the Needham occurrences and the, the observations that he's making locally. Um, he is also uh, including ongoing memoranda of local sightings, and he adds these to the entries. Uh, what is here? Cooper's Hawk, someplace. It says uh, Cooper's Hawk, Ridge Hill, May 10th, 19, 1908, white pine, 60 feet up, five fresh eggs. Also beyond Cartwright's, it's Cartwright Road, in White Pine, 20 feet up, May 18th, 1909. May 11th, 1912, High Rock Woods, 20 feet in oak, one egg. 20 feet, 60 feet. He's climbing the trees and to look into the, to look into the, um, the nest to see, what's, to see what's going on. And you can see from the dates, 1908, uh, 1909, 1912, that these, these um, researches are, these, these observations are ongoing. And as he finds something new or something to add, he'll go back to his book and he'll write it in. He also made identification guides, how to tell apart uh, many similar, some many of the similar species. And this is notorious with warblers who um, tend to interbreed. So a lot of them are very hard to tell apart. So he's making um, characteristics. First, first you decide is the belly white or yellow? And then, you know, once you get to the belly white or yellow, does it have, you know, throat black, wing white, you know, then you could start like a branching diagram to separate the characteristics and, and figure out exactly which species you're looking at. The 1912 volume is the grandest production bearing the title, A Rambler's Companion in the Woods and Fields and Along the Shores of New England. This volume is a synthesis of the previous three Information from the earlier years is summarized and consolidated into an authoritative local field guide. This is also the most lavishly illustrated of the four. Although Fuller enjoyed good health in his later years, it is likely that by 1912, at the age of 67, he was putting his tree climbing days behind him and was summing up his work. Illustrating each entry is a stunning little work of art. It may be as small as a profile of a bird's head, or it may be the full body. There are pages of feature comparisons, heads, beaks, wings, tails, portraits are tipped into the seams. Uh, we were just talking about woodpeckers. And here's some more. There's the pileated woodpecker we were talking about. 
Um, but he's got in each one, he's got his um, his identification guide, his characteristics, um, physical characteristics, habitat characteristics, sightings, and any other information he can he can um, incorporate. And occasionally, and these are the fun ones, little vignettes ornament the text itself, as with an entry on the snow bunting. It says down here, Maynard says, uh, Maynard is a colleague of his, Maynard says that a flock flying appears like drifting leaves, each bird wandering right and left above and below, in which a small flock of, and, and, and this page, a small flock of buntings um, is flying in from the margin and into the manuscript and the words are written around, around them. The text might be bordered by the long bill of the sickle-billed curlew or describe the curve around the fat rump of an eider. But as much as we enjoy looking at these journals, what are we learning? What, what do they tell us that is of ongoing scientific relevance? After untold centuries of, of survival, the, of those best adapted to the various conditions under which they live, the several species of birds as we now see them around us could continue to hold their own in the same abundance for centuries to come. But there is one disturbing element in all of this and that arises from the, from the very one that should be their chief protector, man himself. The population of Needham in Fuller's day was about 4,000 people. It is now close to 35,000. For us, this century plus was a time of rapid growth in, eco in economy, technology, and population. But from the bird's eye view, this was a catastrophic upheaval in climate and habitat. So although we treasure the Fuller journals because they are so beautiful, their real value lies in what they can tell us about changes in the bird population over time. The familiar woodsy New England landscape around us is mostly secondary growth. Settlement and farming in the colonial period largely deforested our area. Um, you know, it is, it is said that uh, in 1620, a squirrel could run from, uh, you know, New York to Maine and never leave the tops of the trees. Uh, by 1830, New England was more than 90% deforested. The painting below by Timothy Newell Smith is, um, a scene of North Hill from Forest Street. Um, you can see that there are very few trees. Uh, there's cattle pasture in the background there and farmland. Um, but most of that wood had been taken. It had been taken to burn for fuel. It had been taken to build. Um, by this point, if you wanted to build a wooden house, you pretty much took down another wooden house and reused the materials because Wood became had become so um, so scarce, and also you know in the early colonial days a lot of the wood was um, old growth wood was shipped to England for shipbuilding because it was stronger and the the boards were quite broad. So so wood was a valuable resource in colonial New England and was used up um, within a relatively short period of time. This of course made a major habitat change for the birds. Paintings of Needham from the mid 1800s, as well as early maps and photos, show this cleared landscape of fields and meadows. Modern views of these same scenes, this is essentially the same place now, um, the upper photo. Modern views of these same scenes show significant regrowth of the tree cover. In Fuller's time, the landscape was in transition. The regional decline of farming in favor of mercantilism and manufacturing, soon to be followed by the local transition to a suburban residential community favored this process of modest reforestation. Thus the Needham landscape that Fuller knew was different from the one we know. And since we can identify from his notes, both the bird notes and the plant notes, where many of his observations were made, it is possible for us to, to enumerate some of the differences. In addition to the bird descriptions, Fuller kept census records of most of the birds that he saw each year. These records were readily compared to, are readily compared to modern population data. For example, in 1912, Fuller made this table of the migration dates of warblers in Eastern Massachusetts. The earliest species to arrive in 1912 was the common little pine warbler. You can see across the, uh, the first line there, 
shows up uh, by you know May 20, uh, March 29th, and then this persistent through the summer. Um, he first observed it in the last week of March and consistently, as I said, through the summer. Uh, thereafter, the black and white warbler, you sort of look down the, as you look down the list, the black and white warbler, the black-throated green warbler, and the yellow warbler, all common species then as now arrived about a month later. The Cape May and Tennessee and bay-breasted warblers made a brief appearance in mid-May as they migrated northward. And more interesting, the blue-winged warbler, now fairly common here in the summer, was rare here in 1912. Its habitat had been shifting to the north. Conversely, the golden-winged and Nashville warblers, whose ranges are now contracting, were common here in Fuller's day. So we can see from his from his census records and his, um, his sort of abundance records, the dotted line is periodic, the solid line is fairly common, um, how these birds were showing up in the local area and how it compares to what we know now. And one that I find kind of remarkable um, is the, the raptors. He points out that uh, vultures, if you look at turkey vultures, accidental from the south, um, they, were, they were rare in his time. Uh, we see them all the time now. Morning doves, rather rare, spring and fall. Um, these are birds that are extremely common now, but in his day were very rare. We see a lot of changes like that in his notes. Uh, this is his list of sightings for the years between 1901 and 1907. You can see the dates at the top, the very top of the page. In other volumes, full of recorded sightings over time or relative abundance in the period from 1901 to 1907, he saw vultures only three years out of the seven. These are birds now seen daily in Needham, often circling in groups of three or four. Hawks of various species, even the red-tailed hawk, were not always seen. Fuller noted in 1905 that the birds of prey were becoming increasingly scarce and that the red-shouldered hawk was the only raptor to be commonly seen in Needham. Now we have several common species, especially the red-tailed hawk. On the other hand, bald eagles, though scarce, were noted every year of the seven. Cardinals and morning doves were rarer in Fuller's day. And there's a notable northward shift in ranges, good evidence that our climate is warmer than it was 100 years ago. And the most pestilential of species, the European starling, was still unknown in rural habitats in 1910, having been newly introduced uh, into New York's Central Park. Um, the red dots are just some of the, some of the, the, the slightly more remarkable um, Canada goose here, the first row, the red dot in the first row. He's only seeing Canada goose two years out of seven. He's only seeing a turkey vulture three years out of seven. Um, he's only seeing the red-tailed hawk four years out of the seven, but he's seeing bald eagles seven years out of the seven. Nighthawks, seven years out of the seven. Um, Perilla warblers, Vesper sparrows, these are birds that are now relatively scarce for us. Um, they're seen, but they're not that common. Tufted titmice, mouses, tufted titmice, three years out of the seven. So you can see there's a, there's a considerable change in what he sees versus what we see. And even if you look at, um, when I first moved to Needham, I bought a copy of the Peterson's Field Guide. Um, and a couple of years ago, I bought the new edition. And you look at some of the some of the distribution maps, and even in that 20-year period, there's been a significant change, a significant shift northward for some of these species. So this is only a cursory tour of the information contained in Fuller's field books. Much more can be extracted from the journal entries, the tables, and the various notes he kept. A comparison of Fuller's information with data from systematic local census records can yield useful information about local habitat and climate change in the last century. So we learn about birds from Fuller's books, but we also learn about Fuller, a man of patience and precision, surely, who recorded every fact and image in painstaking detail, a man respected by his colleagues and neighbors for the breadth of his knowledge. But for all that, a man of great sensibility and enthusiasm who never lost his wonder at the infinite variety of nature and who would still climb a tree to peer into a nest at the age of 67. 
One of the first evidences of the approach of spring is the arrival of the migrating birds from their winter homes in the south, always an event of great importance to the bird crank. And I hope it may always be considered one in the spring at least. Thoreau says, if the warble of the first bluebird does not thrill you, know that the morning and spring of your life have passed. Judged by this, I am right in the heyday of my youth. Thank you. Now we'll go back to the um, big screen and be happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, is, is this um, information like at Harvard, did, did they copy all of this and take it um, to use? Uh, they do not, no, they do not have copies of the books. They know about them. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually, I, I spent some time at the um, herbarium with some of their, some of the um, plant specimens, but right. um, no, I've never actually, I know they know his bird collections exist, but I don't mm -hmm. think they've ever, they've never asked to use them. Yeah, and what about Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology? Because they probably would love to see those. They possibly would. Uh, no, I've yeah. never contacted. We actually have had a, a sort of simmering on the back burner, long-standing project. I would love to get these um, assessed and published. You know, in part, it's a transcription issue. Um, in part, it's a reproduction issue. I mean, if you look at some of the pages, like, you know, the one with the um, buntings flying in from the side, part of the charm and characteristic of these books is the layout, which means they have to be done as, um, they have to be replicated as opposed to simply, you know, printed and filmed. Right. And we actually did have a discussion with um, a, a publisher about these several years ago, but, um, you know, the cost is high. Yes. <laughs> really talking, you're really talking about basically a five volume box set, you know, one, one, rep, one replication of each volume plus um, a sort of text and commentary right. volume as well. So, so it's, you know, it's sort of in the back of my head is something I you know, really, really would like to do. I have a close friend who's um, an ornithologist with the World Wildlife Fund. And when I once sent him a page, he was, he was like, he said, I can't believe this, this is amazing. You know, I mean, I think they're, they're books that have real value in, in scientific terms. Absolutely, yeah. You know, local history and artistic terms. Uh, we just have to sort of marshal the time and resources. Yeah. To, to well, Cornell, Cornell probably has the the best ornithology um, lab in the oh, world, I guess. Um, we have some friends there. Maybe I'll mention it to them. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy <laughs> to, talk to get about in it. touch with you. Yeah. Happy to talk about it with them. Yeah. yeah. All right. Did Good. Did he travel much? He did. <laughs> But he didn't, um, he traveled mostly in New England. Because that Bachman's warbler is, is something that I didn't see. You know, he, he drew a beautiful picture of it, but I didn't see it in the other journals that you flipped through. And no. that's not a bird that we get here or, or ever not. did. He also mentions the um, uh, um, ivory bill woodpecker. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think he did go south at least once. Yeah, he, he would not, have picked up um, the Bachmans en route. Yeah, he he wasn't um, he wasn't a big traveler outside of the immediate area, but I think he did occasionally go out to see something. You know, I know he went out to see the last of the um, passenger pigeons. No, that was he. He noted that that was gone in 1914. Um, yeah. No, what are those those prairie chickens out in the Martha's the Vineyard? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he went to see the last of those before it died. Yeah, he, um, he would he would sort of make occasional forays out, but but for the most part he stayed. Yeah, I think the, the that was the heath hen. The heath hen, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah the heath hen. Do you know anything about the uh, seasonal pattern of the wrens? They've been here all summer, and I've been feeding them, and suddenly they're gone. Is it their pattern to leave and not come back until the spring? Uh, I don't personally. He would. He probably has. Though there, I don't see a lot of. I didn't see a lot of wren observations. Um. So I don't know how. I mean, I don't see a lot of wrens now. Um. But they were here this summer. 
Yeah. And I remember a couple, like 10 or seven, eight years ago, we had Nighthawks everywhere. Um, it's the only year I've ever seen them here, but I would sit on my, you know, sit on my back porch and they were sitting in the tree on my yard and I would just see them go by and, you know, tens, twenties, and I've never, had never seen a Nighthawk. I had to look it up and I've never seen them since, but so they do, you know, they do have eruptions where they, they sort of, their pattern changes briefly. Um, we get a couple species of wren and the house wrens are here in the summer and then they um, migrate down to the Carolinas, Virginia and further wow. south. And then the Carolina wren, re, you know, remarkably enough, is another one of these ones that Fuller would not have seen mm -hmm. here at all back in the day. That's a, as, as you would guess, is an import from Carolina as yeah. uh, climate changes happen. That bird hangs around uh, all year. It's the one that says tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle out there. Okay, yeah, I will see, I will see house wrens every once in a while, but I haven't seen any this year. Um, but, but they're not, yeah, you'd think, you'd think they'd be more common. <laughs> but, you know, the other thing too is um, finches. You know, they used to be, you see finches all the time. I haven't seen a purple finch in a couple of years. Uh, we used to have a tree full of goldfinches, and now I see them, but not in the same abundance. They're they're pretty abundant right here. Um, the the purple finches, or more likely here, house finches, had some kind of a horrible eye disease over the last few years, and mm. it just decimated their numbers. Okay. So that's that's their story. Yeah, I will get bluebirds passing through um, occasionally. Uh, there's they, there's a little spot in one of the ash trees outside of the history center. Uh, that they like. And so sometimes in May, I'll see bluebirds there for a couple of days. Um, if my cherry crop is doing well, I'll get Orioles for about two weeks, pillaging my, and you really, you know, I don't like crows eating my cherries, but frankly, to have eight or 10 Orioles in my cherry tree is kind of a nice trade-off. <laughs> so, you know, as they're passing through, they'll come and steal my cherries and go on their way. Um, Can you tell us a little about, about your own history? How have you developed such a huge uh, knowledge base for birds? <laughs> uh, I just, just, just do over time, I think, you know, sort of watching, watching what's out there and, um, you know, it started, well, it started when we moved, we moved to Cambridge from Connecticut and we put up a bird feeder outside our window and within three days, I think we had the downstairs neighbor pounding on the door saying we're attracting rats and please get rid of it. So um, that didn't work. But when we moved to Needham, we, you know, we had a pretty good, pretty good bird population. So we started watching them here. My parents moved to the Cape and they had a very good bird population. We got them some feeders and some suet feeders and seed feeders and a hummingbird. They had a ton of hummingbirds. Um, you know, so we'd watch them there and I not as, not as systematic as Diane Savitsky. I'm sorry, your name again? That's fine. I'm okay. Michael Paponi. I'm actually a Mass Audubon guy. Okay. I, I'm, I'm on the board, but I'm not an employee. Okay. Uh, Mass Audubon does a breeding bird atlas every five years. Yes. Uh, it's available online for people who want to really uh, drill down on this, and you'll see what the patterns have been. Uh, and there's also a state of the birds report that Dave Sibley's wife, who is a Mass Audubon employee, Joan Walsh, puts out. It's worth uh, clicking onto those things too if you want to follow from uh, Fuller's baseline here. Yeah, and if you do it sort of in reverse, not from the bird itself, but from the location, um, there are some really interesting lo locales in Needham. Um, Ridge Hill. For example, um, the the big fields at Ridge Hill, which you know you're not supposed to walk on. One of the reasons you're not supposed to walk on them is because in in the or in the spring they're the nesting sites for ground nesting larks, um, which are threatened. Um, meadow larks are are having a hard time of yeah. it, and it's um, a, a factor of people mowing too soon in the season as much as anything else. And Bob White's, uh, I mean, yeah. um, uh, bobolinks have the same problem. Yeah, so there, you know, so, so there, are some, there are some interesting localities in Needham, um, you know, that, that go beyond the sort of birds we're used to seeing in our backyards. 
but um, but to compare a systematic census, I think would be really interesting because I think there's a lot of northward shift um, in some of these birds, and especially and when I looked at this person, he said that you know vultures were rare. It's like you gotta be kidding me. Yeah. But yeah, hawks and vultures he almost never saw. <laughs> okay. I have a question. Yeah. Um, what medium did he use to make his illustrations? It's watercolor. And uh, pen and ink, probably, right? Pen and ink, yeah, pen and ink and watercolor. Okay. You know, or he would often sketch them in first. So you can see the ink lines or sometimes the pencil lines, and then he would paint them in afterward. Okay. Do we have any um, of his watercolors left? Did anywhere in the history museum? Well, we have we have all four all four um, of the bird journals belong to the history museum. And we have some of his mother's stuff, and we have this, the, we have two sketchbooks that he did when he was a kid. Right. Um, but I'm not aware that he did sort of artwork as a hobby. You know, in, right. in that sense that he went and painted pictures the way, for example, his uncle did. Um, that picture of the um, house on Forest Street you know, from North Hill, which, which was done by his uncle, but also that painting of the first parish church. And anybody who's a first parish member will recognize that. It's in, it has been in the lobby or was in the lobby last I saw it. Um, is also by Timothy Newell Smith. He did a lot of sort of around town uh, painting. Fuller didn't do that kind of, I'm going to sit here with my sketchbook and draw the scenery kind of painting. It was mostly in service of his other, of his other work. Um, oddly slash unfortunately, he did not, we also have his, his botany journals. He did not illustrate those. Yeah. And that in part, I think is because he could collect and press the plants and he didn't need to. Whereas the birds, that was really the only way to capture the image. You know, this were later day and he could get color photography, he probably would have done something like that. But, but painting was the only way he could, cap he could capture the image and especially when he wanted to do a detailed comparison. He really had to sketch it out. That's, that's pretty much why these are so nicely illustrated. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? It was a great show. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank Talk to you all soon. Thank you. Lots of fun. It is our joy and pleasure to present programs like this to the public, which we do without charge so as many people as possible can join us. So please take a look at our membership page. And um, if you're a museum goer, there's a very good deal on reciprocal memberships that you should also check out.